Hello, I'm Donovan Bigelow, and this is the third lecture in a series on psychopathology. I'll be covering part two of Nancy McWilliams' book, Psychoanalytic Diagnosis, Second Edition, recently pu published after the first edition. In part two, she covers the nine types of character organization. And what she means by that is how people characteristically manage anxiety through various defense mechanisms. She lays out 25 different defense mechanisms in chapters five and six of her text. What she does in the entire part two, but basically the second half of the text, is she uses categories, eight or nine different categories, that she has described as sort of umbrella dynamics, how individuals characteristically manage anxiety, and she's labeled them. There's a lot going on underneath, underneath each one of these categories, but she uses, I think, what now have become quite common words to describe these dynamics. Most everyone will recognize someone they know, possibly even themselves, as belonging in one or two of these categories. Part of, of kind of a humorous response in graduate school is that when we studied these things, most all graduate students in psychology come down with, with what we call the graduate student disease. As we read through these, we see, oh my goodness, I do that. Oh my goodness, I do that too. Oh my good, oh my God, I have all of these things. I'm, I must be really crazy. And it turns out, um, most of the time, that isn't true. What, happens, what has happened is that McWilliams has recognized that these aren't quite as isolated phenomena as perhaps we once thought, that these are human potentialities. And we have the potential for using any and all of these umbrella categories and any or all of the, as she lays it out, 25 different identified defense mechanisms. Now, the truth is, of course, we don't use all of them all the time. Our personal developmental history, our childhood developmental dynamics have pushed us, have gravitated us toward one or two or three. We load on, within certain categories. Now, this is not like the DSM. These aren't discrete categories. These aren't categories that you can put on her little chart. You can put a push pin in and say, aha, I am right there on the chart. Doesn't work that way. It's more, the example I've used before is it, it's as if there was a, a nickel with, with very fuzzy edges. And you put that area down somewhere on the neurotic, borderline, or psychotic vertical axis concerning structure of the mind, and you put that same nickel somewhere across the defensive styles. You can be depressive with a little masochism, you can be narcissistic with a little schizoid withdrawal. So we don't want to be, we want to be accurate, but there isn't any way that the human mind is going to precisely, medically, fit within these categories in any clean, clean way. This is not a medical model. If you go in to an internist with an appendectomy, there are blood tests and there are physical exams that lead directly to an identifiable diagnosis of appendectomy, uh, that an appendectomy is appropriate and nothing else. Uh, if anything else comes up, it's frequently malpractice. Not the case in psychopathology and mental health questions. So we have to recognize, first and foremost, that, that these are fairly specific categories, and the dynamics are identifiable, but we're not going to narrow our diagnosis too quickly. Part of the problem with diagnoses in the mental health field is that there isn't any test that can give you a clean and narrowly identified category to plug a patient into. In fact, the nature of our work with patients suggests that over the course of months, possibly even, I think probably even years, new information comes out, a deeper understanding of the patient's dynamics become clear to the therapist, and so diagnoses can change and can change rather radically over time. McWilliams is giving us a way to think about the patient, not a way simply to categorize them and put them in a category and be done with it. This way of thinking opens up diagnosis, makes it an ongoing process. It's never really finished. It's useful this way, but one has to be careful not to be confused with a medical model, which is diagnosing symptoms that can be assessed and identified 
in a very scientific, physiological way. That's not what's going on here. So, like the vertical axis, she has a method. She has factors that we want to consider in each of the eight or nine categories. The first is drive, affect, and temperament. Now, when she suggests this, I think she is recognizing the universal tendency um, for all fields of psychology now to recognize a biological bedrock. We've come far enough in our understanding of genetics. We've come far enough in our understanding of evolutionary psychology to recognize that we are biological creatures and that at bottom we ought to be able to recognize a, a some kind of biological substrate to most human behavior. As my lecture on uh, evolutionary psychology and behavioral genetics, I think, explained, that part of my science is uh, at a very early stage and we cannot yet with any accuracy, any specificity, or any direct scientifically replicable causal link, put human behavior directly back to genetics or biology or even brain chemistry and neurology. Maybe someday, but not today. What she, she lays out though is recognizing that, that we have a biological bedrock and, we, bedrock and we need to be mindful of that as we work with our patients drive, affect, and temperament, she says. Affect, I think we can agree, most of my colleagues now at least, that research has suggested there is something fundamental about emotion, something below cognition, something below the use of language that's more primary. A four-month-old baby can't use language, doesn't have words, can't express themselves in anything like an adult way. Do they have emotion? No one doubts it who's ever spent five minutes with a baby. So it appears that emotion is more primary, more fundamental, prior to cognition, thinking, rational processes. Uh, her focus on affect is a recognition of that fundamental importance of affect. Uh, in my field now, there's a phrase called temperament, and I think that's a, a large umbrella that takes in all of the, the biological and fundamental emotional dynamics. We do come into the world with certain tendencies in our personalities. Some babies are easily soothed, easy to deal with. Some babies are fussy and difficult to soothe. That's what she means by temperament. So we put all those three together into the first category, which we can, we can highlight as sort of drives or biology. Now, um, the theme that runs throughout the entire part two in all of these, these umbrella categories is that though there may be a biology involved, we don't know what it is, and there is virtually no hard scientific data that can link a particular defensive behavior to any neurological or biological entity, any genetic configuration. I think it's fair to say that the, that you must conclude from the research that, that people who do these things do these things not because they're somehow genetic or biologically predisposed to. They do these things and they react this way to anxiety and they manage anxiety this way using these constellations of defenses because that's the way they were trained, because that's the way they were raised, because those are the lessons that they were taught. Those were the experiences they took in and then resorted to later in their childhoods. Virtually all of these can be seen as the derivatives of childhood developmental dynamics. Okay, that's the first category. The second category are adaptive and defensive operations of the ego. This is, this is the direct reference to the 25 defense mechanisms that she's identified that we have been struggling with as a field for over a hundred years. Freud and his daughter Anna Freud were instrumental in laying down and identifying and, and explaining the dynamics behind the defense mechanisms that the research has continued and I suppose any psychologist has their own list. Any researcher could slice and dice this in different ways. There is broad acceptance of Nancy McWilliams' uh, nosology, of her way of characterizing these things, of the, of the list of them. Uh, I don't want to get lost in arguments about whether reaction formation deserves to be under the heading of some other defense mechanism or not. Um, again, this isn't science. This is useful 
and I'm assuming that in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, other people will come up with research-based lists of defense mechanisms that differ. Okay, I'm not trying to be uh, righteous or perfect or scientific here. I'm trying to be, along with Nancy McWilliams, useful for clinicians and hopefully also to help uh, patients and students and others understand how their minds work and how those around them uh, operate as well. Okay, drive first, adaptive and defensive operations of the ego second, early relational patterns internalized and repeated. This is her recognition of the entire field of object relations. She recognizes, and I think my field is virtually in in unanimous agreement that all personality characteristics find their genesis in childhood developmental dynamics. We are adults with a pattern of behavior that gets laid down in our earliest childhood from birth to three or four or five years old. 90% of who you are, the vast majority of your character and your personality tendencies get laid down without exaggerating at all, in the arms of your mother or your caretaker. These, she believes, are worthy of uh, looking at independently of anything else. Experiences of the self and methods of self-esteem report uh, support. In the 60s and 70s in Chicago, a psychoanalyst named Heinz Kohut, Heinz Kohut, came up with a modification of, of psychoanalytic theory. He called it self-psychology. And what he did basically was expand the earlier ego psychology, Freud's structural model of the mind, id, ego, and superego, and said, you know what, that, that seems artificial. It seems like most people don't have this, or if they do have this, what they have above and around those more primitive structures is a sense of their self. And this, he used a very common word that we all sort of understand, and it makes, it makes a great deal of sense. And I think his theories have been very influential. And this is uh, Dr. McWilliams acknowledging that this is a theoretical innovation that's really quite useful indeed. So how does the person experience themselves? How do they think about themselves? How do they feel about themselves? Uh, the, there's a, in, in sort of pop psychology now, the phrase self-esteem is, is knocked around and everybody talks about it. But I, I think in, uh, in Kohut's theorizing, that has a very technical and specific meaning. How do we maintain our sense of identity? How do we maintain our sense of self? And critical to that is a shift away from the classical understanding of guilt as a as a central motivator to shame. People who are depressed often feel guilty, bad, inadequate. Um, what Heinz Kohut discovered was that a lot of people don't feel that way. What they actually feel is shame. It's not that they f are, see themselves as bad, it's that they're quite shamed when others see them as bad or inadequate. It's not so much who they are as how they perceive others seeing them and that sense of being observed and judged and criticized, um, I, I think rightly has been raised to, um, raised in importance in our consideration of defense mechanisms. She also adds uh, transference and counter-transference outcomes. And I think what she means by that is, it's central to the therapist's understanding of the patient. It's central to how the therapist can help the patient. And I think for others, it's central for understanding uh, to recognize how the patient's childhood dynamics get transferred into their adult life and transferred between the adults they're in relationships with. In addition to that, uh, Dr. McWilliams describes the countertransference, and that's the experience in the therapist, the emotional response of the therapist to the patient. For a long time, Freud believed that that kind of thing simply meant that the therapist needed more therapy, that they should work through that stuff in advance of their work with patients. Um, it's been clear since the, the 1940s that the reactions of the therapist can be critical clinical data that help the therapist understand the patient's mind. Is the patient evoking in the therapist an emotional response that's useful for the therapist's understanding? 
Now the therapist has to be careful. Maybe what's being evoked is some of their own neurotic dynamics. They'd better be able to tease apart what's theirs and what's the patient's. If they can do that, if they can see that their emotional response does in fact have something to do with the way the patient is interacting with them, it's amazingly useful. And I think most of my colleagues now acknowledge that it's necessary to think in those terms to really help our patients uh, as best we can. Another aspect of the treatment process that Dr. McWilliams discusses is the implications for treatment in putting a patient in one of these categories. It makes a difference whether a person is paranoid or depressed, whether a person is masochistic or hysterical. You cannot treat a patient accurately and in a way that's useful if you don't accurately diagnose them. And it makes a huge difference um, how they deal with anxiety in terms of what the therapist can and should do to help make them stronger. As always, because this isn't science, because it isn't hard science, because there isn't one answer that's right and excludes all the others, her final consideration is in what she calls differential diagnosis. Okay, a person may be depressed, but don't they also possibly have some masochistic dynamics? Those two categories sit right next to each other. It's not uncommon at all for a patient, as I said, to, to move between one or two fairly adjacent categories. We must always be open to new clinical data. We must always hold a diagnosis as something tentative, something that makes sense and is useful for us now, but we must remain open that, uh, to additional clinical data that gives us a broader, wider, deeper perspective and will therefore change our diagnosis. So we're going to begin with the, what she calls the typological dimension. And these, that's just the defensive categories. There's a psychopathic, narcissistic, schizoid, paranoid, depressive, masochistic, obsessive compulsive, and hysterical. I will also add dissociative, which was in Nancy McWilliams' first text, and, and because it's a bit controversial, she's taken it out of this one and I think just talked about it generally. But those are the two, four, six, eight, I will add nine defensive categories that I'm going to discuss one, one at a time with considerations of differential diagnosis. And again, I, I have to stress, the goal of this is not to slap a label and be critical. The goal is not to look at people's behavior and say, aha, aha, psychopathology, see this person is mentally ill. The goal is always, first and foremost, to understand. Just understand. Benevolent curiosity is the phrase I've used before that suggests an approach that good therapists should have in their work with patients. And I think, I think people generally, if they could muster a little benevolent curiosity about their partners, about their friends and family, if they could look at the people who they are in good intimate relationships with or not so good relationships with, this material can directly affect how they approach them, how they connect to them possibly help them understand whether they want to be connected or not. But the point uh, of all of this truly has to be uh, a deeper understanding, not a critical judgment. Um, I've talked already, I think, about how the categories overlap and they do load to one or two of these styles that sit next to each other. How did McWill This is important. How does McWilliams put them the way she did on that line from from uh, psychopathic to hysterical and dissociative. She put them there in that order for a very specific reason. She believes, and I think she's right about this, that from left to right, the defenses represent a continuum, a continuum of object relatedness. If a person has psychopathic or narcissistic tendencies, they are minimally connected to other people. If you are depressive, hysterical OCD, if you're dissociative, then, then you have intense connections to other people and the defenses manage them. So what we have on that chart is a very conscious and conscientious attempt to look at one of the fundamental discriminators of defensive dynamics. How is it that these things assist or inhibit 
relatedness to other people. She wants to be clear as well, again, that dynamics are not pathology. That there's plenty of instances where we can all do elements of any of these categories and it's not automatically considered mental illness. Um, it is only when growth and adaptation, only when healthy functioning is undercut, can we label anything a mental illness or a dysfunction. Um, we all have the potential to, under certain circumstances, under stress, under anxiety, under trauma, we all may react in certain of these ways. That doesn't make it uh, an automatic mental illness label. It just means we have to look at what's going on a little deeper. Um, we have to distinguish character pathology from responsiveness to circumstances. And she uses several clinical examples and some common sense ones about people who get into hard situations and react in a certain way. But it's not necessarily psychopathological. It may just be the difficult circumstances that bring out elements of their personality that otherwise uh, don't seem to be a problem. Um, and I, I think that's, that may require a little extra explanation. I think most people recognize that you subject a human to enough trauma and they're capable of doing almost anything. And I think McWilliams wants us all to keep that clearly in mind, that we have an innate flexibility to move among the defensive dynamics in ways that foster our adaptive living. And it's only when what we do inhibits that adaptive living, only when it stands in the way of our growth and development, only when it stands in the way of our interacting with others in useful, healthy ways, does, does she find it appropriate to put a mental illness label on anything, at least for a while. Um, how much can we change? How much of these patterns, if you recognize yourself in one or more of these categories, do you, uh, is there hope for change? And the answer is, of course. Uh, but it's also not completely fluid. We can modify, but we cannot transform. I can help any patient that comes into my office. I can help them become stronger, better adapted. I can help them move from defensive dynamics that inhibit their growth to a more functional defensive dynamic that, that assist in their living and their and their relational dynamics. That's, that's true. I can't turn them into a different person. I can't make them change in any radical way. The things that get laid down in our childhood remain who we are, and the most good therapy can do is build around that, build a superstructure around that of healthy, dynamic interactions. We can modify, we cannot transform. I think any any other approach is not supported by the clinical data of the last hundred years. That seems like a limitation, and perhaps it is. Um, on the other side of that very same coin, uh, McWilliams is clear that insight and understanding, insight concerning these childhood dynamics, insight concerning, understanding concerning how these things operate within us, bring us almost directly and immediately a sense of empowerment that, that if you truly can get at why you do the things you do, what was their developmental function initially, how is it when you go through her analytic method, how to drive affect temperament, the defensive operations of the ego, the maintenance of the self, etc. When you understand that, then you inevitably to that degree can generate a sense of freedom, a sense of honest choice, choice that's real, choice that, that you can make in the real world that isn't just a fraud, that isn't just a, a rationalization for doing the same thing over and over again. Um, it's, it, it can be the, the gate through which honest self-acceptance uh, can be achieved. And I think to the, to the degree we can, understanding these dynamics open up the possibility of some degree of mastery of our life. Maybe mastery is, uh, again, overly optimistic. 
certainly adaptive functioning, certainly getting stronger and more capable. Of that I have not the slightest doubt. Uh, the last thing McWilliam says in her introductory material is to be careful with these categories. That of course, in, uh, 50, 50 years ago, people thought differently about categories. In 50 years from now, we all hope uh, we will have a more refined picture of human mental functioning. So she's, she's not, she's absolutely not being rigid here and that she's open to uh, seeing new categories. She's opening, open to seeing uh, variations on the categories she's laid down. This is useful and I hope as we go through the categories you'll see a great deal about yourself uh, in some of them and you might, if you do that, achieve some, some freedom in your life. That's the, that's the hope. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, chapter 7 is psychopathic or antisocial personalities. Now, frankly, these are the scary ones. These are the dangerous ones. The phrase sociopath, antisocial, psychopathic, these are all phrases that get tossed around in, in, in the literature, they get tossed around in, in our culture. Everyone knows what a psychopath is. Um, these, they're portrayed in movies all the time. They're quite common. I mean, this is Silence of the Lambs. Uh, Hannibal Lecter, that character in that series of movies, was one of the most graphic portrayals of a psychopath ever in film. Uh, murderers, cult leaders, virtually anyone on death row right now is fairly diagnosed as a psychopath. They are, most of the time, loaded down on the borderline or psychotic level and that's because developmentally these folks have had some fundamental failure in their developmental dynamics and some fundamental failure of nurturing care. Um, but I want to be careful here because it's not about criminality. It's about manipulation. It's about internal motivation. You can be a psychopath and never break a law. I think in our press, uh, the Green River Killer, for example, everyone gets, I don't think anyone doubts for a moment, that, that he is uh, profoundly psychopathic in, in his character. Um, but that's not necessary. The, the real important innovation in this way of thinking is that, it, is that it's not what you do. It's not the thing you do. It's the meaning of the thing you do in your unconscious world, in your psychic reality. What's the motivation? Two people can do exactly the same thing. One might be healthy and one might be quite disturbed. Again, so we have to look underneath the pure behavior. Now, I think most of my colleagues would agree that, that if you're a murderer, if, if you're a rapist, if you're uh, generally engaging in, in violent criminal activity on a regular basis, then you might almost automatically be put in a psychopathic category. It's hard to argue any much else. But I think those the category cannot be limited to just that. There's plenty of, of very powerful people, business leaders, possibly even politicians at times, who might fairly fall into uh, this category even if they don't overtly commit crimes. Um, violence is, I think, at the end of the spectrum, but it's a broad spectrum and, and lots of folks can fit into it. Um, so let's go through McWilliams' method, drive, affect, and temperament. Um, it's possible that these folks are more sort of constitutionally uh, fitted for aggression, but again, not much direct scientific evidence of that. What seems clear in their defensive and adaptive processes is that they tend to act out. They tend to have emotions that they are absolutely unaware of. Um, talking isn't about relating how you feel. It isn't about relating emotional experiences. It's about manipulation. It's about control. They are frequently in, very much in denial about their own emotional life and they use acting out to manifest unconscious emotional dynamics. Omnipotent control, projective identification, dissociation and acting out are the four primary defensive dynamics in a psychopathic personality. Overwhelmingly, their primary need is to exert power. That is how they get through their day. That is how they manage their internal experience. They exert power and control over others. That stills their inner experience to some degree at least. 
that acting out is a defense against that inner experience. But what is that inner experience? Most of the good research on psychopaths shows clearly that they are drenched in shame and it most of the time uh, also contains an element of sexual perversion. They have a complete lack of superego, of conscious, consciousness, not consciousness, conscience. They have very little manifest guilt. They use others. They don't treat others as whole objects. They, they see others as objects of their usage. They can be exploited, they can be killed, they can be abused. Um, people function to serve them, to be used by them. Often it's about getting over on another, using and exploiting or hurting the other to manifest an experience of their own power. But of course it's a defense. If they're using it as a manifestation of their own power to prove to themselves that they're powerful, what are they doing that against internally? What's the meaning of that thing to them? And very often it's childhoods filled with shame, exploitation, and abuse. They counter that by the phrase is malignant grandiosity. These people frequently are in positions of power over others. Some politicians, business leaders, cult leaders frequently fall into this category. They dissociate. That's another, another defense. They dissociate from personal responsibility. One of the striking characteristics of the sociopaths I have personally worked with is their utter lack of, of guilt and the only thing they feel about the terrible crimes some of them have committed is that they feel bad about getting caught. They feel frustrated. They're, they're resentful about getting caught, not about what they've done. Um, part of the problem in the research in this field is that because they lie characterologically, because lying serves a purpose to them, if they can convince you that what that you're telling the truth when they know they're lying shamelessly, quite literally shamelessly, then they feel power. These are the folks who might be considered uh, compulsive liars because the lying has a motive. It, it's not just that they're liars. Their lying is a manipulative exercise in, the, in, in control, in authority, in power. And one of the one, uh, psychopaths I worked with directly for a couple of years, would lie to everyone about the same thing. And when any of these people got together and compared stories, it was obvious it couldn't possibly be. Uh, he told 15 different stories to 15 different people. And it appeared that he almost enjoyed it because he could convince these people, oh yes, what a sad story, or how amazing, or how terrible. And when they would acknowledge or when they would accept the truth of what he was saying, he almost got a, a physical rush of power. Um, and it isn't until he got caught, this, this web of lies that he spun ended up trapping himself in. And he was, again, most, uh, most unsettled by the fact that he got caught, not that he was lying. It, it seems, uh, so let's talk about relational patterns uh, in this dynamic. These are, are frequently children who have been the most abused. Childhoods of insecurity, chaos, and abuse. Interesting at times, however, harsh dis discipline combined with overindulgence, materially indulgent. They're given a lot of things, but, it, but they are emotionally deprived. One of the patterns that seems to come out consistently, weak, depressed, or masochistic mothers, explosive, inconsistent, and sadistic fathers. That combination will frequently generate a response in the child that develops into a psychopathic personality. If the child feels weak, if the child feels um, an absence of any self, any sense of their own efficacy or power, they often are driven to confirm their power by acting out against others. Um, this is where the acknowledging regular normal emotions gets equated with weakness and vulnerability. The, the, the presentation of a psychopath is frequently almost utterly lacking in, in emotions. They are almost robotic. 
intellectual, rational, seeming rational at least. Um, and it's because they have, been, they have equated emotion with pain. They've equated emotion with being victimized. Words are used to control, not to communicate, especially not to communicate feelings. It's almost as if they have no internal experience that they're remotely aware of. They don't seem to, to have any internalized attachment. They, don't ha they haven't taken in sufficient good objects. They don't identify even with their parents in some, in some way. So we see, what we see almost is a sense of hollowness that gets filled with external acting out, often masking a type of, of hostility, anger, aggression, often masking shame, humiliation, and a history of abuse or neglect. Parents that model a sense of entitlement often generate often generate a child's tendency to demonstrate their power externally. If the child gets the message that they're entitled to exert their power, frequently that goes down a very bad road. McWilliams worries, and I think rightly, that as our culture seems to be fragmenting, as the nuclear family has seriously deteriorated, children are being put more and more in situations where the precursors of, psycho, of, of psychopathy, of antisocial personality disorders, seem to be on the rise. And her fear is that we're raising uh, generations of, of psychopaths. She has the same concern for the other categories in, in, in narcissism. She suggests in a different article that we're raising a generation of malignant narcissists. I think there's some, some truth to this concern. Again, psychopaths have this conflict within them. They want power. They want to feel strong and omnipotent. Um, but they fear that, the, and they have experienced themselves early on. And again, this gets repressed into unconscious. They, they fear a sense of their own desperate weakness. And that's what they're counteracting with their acts of power and control. Um, she also suggests that developmentally, uh, experience of emotionally exhausted caregivers who don't have the ability themselves to establish sane and rational and developmentally appropriate boundaries can give children the sense of their own entitled exploitation of others. If children don't learn boundaries, don't learn to play nice in the sandbox effectively because parents aren't capable of establishing healthy boundaries, then what we have is children who grow up uh, with the precursors to this kind of willingness, entitlement to manipulate and then sometimes hurt others. I think one of the overall tendencies for a psychopathic self is the sense that they never allow any tenderness in their life. They're hard. They're cruel. And that goes into uh, Dr. McWilliams' uh, analysis of transference and counter-transference dynamics. These aren't folks that come to therapy. Um, these folks get therapy perhaps when they're in prison, and even then they try to get over on the therapist. The very nature of, of the dynamic runs counter to, the, to what's necessary for any kind of meaningful therapy. They will manipulate, they will attempt to get over on, they will lie to the therapist. It becomes just another power struggle for them. So A, they almost never show up except perhaps on the very very vanilla end of the spectrum. Uh, I don't think very many therapists see these folks in, in any kind of private practice at all. The feeling you get around one of these people is fear. They project into you a sense of their own malevolence. You get a creepy feeling. You get a, a feeling of, of deep anxiety. And I think I think if people paid attention to that a little better, they might get themselves out of trouble or keep themselves out of trouble uh, as often as not. Um, I, I, Silence of the Lambs, the, the character that played the, I think, the most graphic description of a psychopath um, in film, um, was paralleled in, in TV by the, the TV show The Sopranos. Tony Soprano was a mafia 
middle-level executive, I guess you could call him. He was a murderer. He was willing and able to kill and hurt people. He was endearing. He was a family man. He was uh, loyal to his friends. He, um, I, I think that's one of those middle-level psychopaths who, in our culture, we, in some ways, uh, in a very misguided way, look up to. He was powerful in his milieu. He was powerful in his field. And we sort of look up to power, but there's always something about that presentation that leaves us a little uncomfortable. If you go back two or three generations, the Godfather series had almost exactly the same kind of character. We, we look up to the Godfather character, even though you could argue he was a psychopathic mass murderer without too much difficulty at all. So we have to be careful as clinicians, and I think we have to be careful in our society how we characterize these people. Uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. That's an old saying. I think in a culture or in a place or time or a group where everyone is weak and vulnerable, the strong man is often held up in great esteem. It might be effective in that particular milieu, but it is exceedingly dangerous. All right, let's move on to uh, chapter eight, the narcissistic personalities. And, and I think McWilliams is correct that it seems we are generating more and more of these types. They are close to the psychopath, but they're not nearly as dangerous. They have some of the same tendencies. They are maintaining their self-esteem by getting external affirmation. Now the difference here, like the psychopaths, they're doing that excessively because we all maintain self-esteem to some degree by getting external affirmation. Students like getting A's on a test. They like being told they're nice, they're liked, they're, they look good. They're, everyone enjoys other people's uh, praise. I, I think we're going back to evolutionary psychology. We are, we are a tribal creature. We're sensitive to those around us. We need people around us and we need them to maintain our self-esteem. The narcissist simply does what's human in an excessive way, in a way that generates maladaptive behavior. How did that happen? Something's missing from their inner lives. We have here a, a good example, I think, of the shift from the classic model of psychic conflict to a deficit model, that something's missing in their lives. Something's, there's an emptiness they're trying to fight against. It isn't th that they're in conflict about sexual or aggressive drives. It isn't that they're overwhelmed with guilt in some ways. It's that they have a sense of themselves as hollow, empty. Shame is a is a fairly constant unconscious dynamic in narcissistic personalities. Um, these are the folks who don't feel bad and therefore guilty. They feel shame at being seen as bad and put up what we call a narcissistic shell. They put up a front. The narcissism is really, and this is the, the critical element in understanding a narcissistic dynamic. They have a shell, uh, what Donald Winnicott would call a false self. What you see is not what you get. Or perhaps what you see is all that you get, and there's n very little underneath it besides shame, the, the fear of humiliation, anxiety. So narcissists behave in the way they do because that's how they avoid an internal experience of great shame and humiliation. They present themselves as grandiose. They present themselves um, as aloof, emotionally inaccessible. They have fantasies of omnipotence. They overvalue their own creativity. They can be very judgmental, self-assured, arrogant. They will preemptively attack others who they sense might not go along with their program. The actuality underneath that shell is an inner sense of terror, insufficiency, shame, weakness, inferiority, and vulnerability. And so they're annoying people to be around. One of the countertransference reactions to a narcissist is annoyance because they blot you out. They don't, they don't acknowledge your humanity. They don't acknowledge you as a healthy whole person. And so the, the feeling you get around these people is often annoyance. Um, that's one of the countertransference indicators that you're dealing with that kind of person. 
but that arrogance is really a very thin shell. Drive, affect, and temperament. There may be some uh, constitutional, biological sensitivity to unverbalized emotional messages. Uh, but it looks more like this gets generated because the children were used as narcissistic extensions of the parents. It is the parents who generate the narcissism in the child as a reaction to the way the children are treated. Um, again, this is the child takes in the experience of being seen as bad and therefore has to erect the defense against the anxiety that that evokes in someone who's sensitive to other people's opinions of them. I think most good clinicians will recognize that with narcissism there's something particularly dangerous about the level of envy that they have. They may act arrogant, they may act all full of themselves. The conversations may be all about them all the time. One of my favorite jokes was the narcissist who walks in and says something at some point like, all right, that's enough of me talking about me. What do you think about me? If someone says anything like that, you're pretty clear that they're in chapter eight narcissistic personalities. Underneath that annoying tendency seems to lie very consistently an experience of envy. They know they're hollow. They know at some unconscious level that they do not match what they're supposed to match in terms of their skills and ability. This narcissistic shell is the defense against that feeling and that anxiety. And what that translates to frequently is envy against those who are in fact good. A narcissistic person, when they meet someone who truly can perform to that level, who truly is a good person and an accomplished person, you will find frequently that the narcissist attacks them, cannot stand the fact that their existence insults them, points to their own hollowness. Real achievement is a threat to a narcissist's shell and a threat that evokes in them all of their primitive terrors. You will find in the narcissist a tendency to deplore others, to scorn, to ridicule. Um, underneath that is the desperate need to be the things that they are not. And when faced with those things, they can react quite aggressively. Now, they're not psychopaths. They're not overtly dangerous most of the time. At worst, they are aggravatingly annoying. And if a narcissist does get faced with that kind of experience, more often than not they will simply leave. They will reject, they will abandon, they will move away. They tend not to be dangerous, just really annoying. Key uh, defensive and adaptive processes are idealization and devaluation. You see always with a narcissist a splitting. They idealize themselves and devalue anyone else. If you're in the inner circle of a narcissist, you can be highly valued until you're not, until you disagree, until you contradict, until perhaps you achieve something that threatens their narcissistic equilibrium, and then you are devalued rather dramatically. There's a constant tendency to rank who's good, who's not, who's succeeded, who isn't. A narcissist is almost always in an intense evaluative process. There's a perfectionism about them that's part of what's so annoying. They, they do not see themselves as, as forgivably human. If something is pointed out to them that reflects their inner vulnerability, they will react aggressively against an experience of being inherently flawed. That's what they're fighting against. They experience themselves as inherently flawed, and the defensive shell of narcissism is a defense against that. It's it, in some ways, in some ways, if you can, if you recognize this material, if you recognize this dynamic going on in someone else, your first response really isn't annoyance because it's not about you. Ironically, um, the narcissist's response to you can can be seen as something going by you. They're not attacking you, really. They're really trying to defense against, defend against their own inner experience. And so what you see with just a little compassion and a little understanding is how truly, truly sad and miserable these people's lives are. It's, it, it can be tremendously tragic. Um, I, I overheard a conversation 20 years ago um, 
I, the details don't matter, but I saw a man talking to three younger women uh, at a swimming pool, and and he was so arrogant, so full of himself. The women were sort of rolling their eyes, and he was oblivious to it all. He was showing off, and he thought he was so fabulous. At one point he said, I own this town. And you could just hear in his voice the narcissism. And, and I, I looked at the, the young women who were reacting to him, and my first thought was, because I was, you know, 30 or 40 feet away, I, I could, and he wasn't doing this annoying stuff to me, I could see he was annoying the heck out of them. But my first response really was how miserable this shell of a man must have been, how sad a life he was leading. I think this is maybe the best example in the text of how understanding can lead to compassion instead of judgment. Um, the perfectionistic tendency in, in narcissist is a setup. It can't work. Uh, no one's perfect. And life will r repeatedly show you how uh, you're not perfect. And the grandiosity of the narcissist is constantly being punctured. And therefore, their lives are filled with anxiety. Their narcissistic shell is constantly being punctured. Um, and so they live tentatively. They live on the brink, on the knife's edge of overwhelming anxiety. Really quite miserable. There is some data that they, that they burn out of this dynamic as they get older. Men and women who have been narcissistic in their 40s, 50s, and 60s do seem to mellow a little bit. So I guess there's some hope there in just sort of normal developmental processes. Um, this uh, relational patterns in narcissism. This is, this is a type that less serious than the psychopath, but still this dynamic runs counter to the necessity of of, the, of, of therapy, of what's required for good therapy. You're not going to get a hard, malignant narcissist in therapy. Why? Well, because they know so much more than the therapist does. They're so much smarter than the therapist is. How could they possibly rely on anyone else? And that's the underlying dynamic. A narcissist cannot say thank you. A narcissist does not feel guilt. Because both of those things, both of those foundational human experiences, to apologize for a mistake you've made, to feel gratitude for a benefit conferred. I mean, that is the human uh, condition. It ought to be the healthy human condition. Narcissists feel none of that because that would mean they're connected to others in a way that makes them vulnerable. And their narcissistic shell, relationally, has been tied to childhood development experiences of shame and humiliation, and they're not going there which makes therapy with them almost impossible. If, if they have been used by a parent to fulfill the parent's own needs, my child goes to Harvard. Right? If, that's, if the parent drives the child to behaviors that are whose function is to make the parent feel better about themselves, to, make, to, to give the parent bragging rights as opposed to what the child needs, to become a narcissistic extension of the parent can generate narcissistic dynamics in the child because your true self is always seen as not good enough. What you achieve is important for someone else but not for you. And therefore, you have to keep achieving. You have to generate a thicker and thicker narcissistic shell in order to meet other people's needs and expectations. Parents who put children in an environment of constant evaluation often generate narcissistic dynamics, even if they're judged positively. Uh, this is one of those things that a narcissistic parent can create a narcissistic child. Most of the time, if a parent has pathology, it doesn't generate, it isn't like catching the flu from your parent. You get the same flu the parent has. Almost never does that happen directly because the dynamics are very different. It does seem to happen in, in narcissists. A narcissistic mother or father can generate a narcissistic child because of the way the dynamic uh, is responded to. And so I want to, there's a subtle element here. Uh, our culture has shifted in the last 15, 20 years. We now are so concerned with our children's self-esteem that we're constantly praising them. No one is judged. No one, I mean, there are schools that don't give grades. There are schools where everyone's a winner. They don't give prizes anymore for the winners because that will hurt the self-esteem of the losers. Uh, 
The problem with that is I think it's generating narcissistic dynamics. If everyone's a winner, uh, that's unrealistic. The children know perfectly well that not, not everyone's a winner. The children know perfectly well that what they're being told about themselves isn't true. And so they will comply externally by creating this compliant or narcissistic shell around them to meet what they perceive as the expectations of the adults in their life. It seems to me that this is a grossly misguided dynamic, probably generated by narcissistic teachers and parents who themselves feel judged and therefore don't want to judge others. And so they create a dynamic that actually recreates their own trauma. The irony here is tragic and does no good service to our children, it seems. Um, the result of this in the, the self-structure of, of the narcissistic patient is that being good enough is never good enough. They have a, f a vague falseness about them. Shame, envy, emptiness, incompleteness. That's the underlying. It's, they almost seem like there's an, an ugliness or inferiority within them that they're trying to hide. It generates a self-righteousness, a, a superficial pride, a contempt for others, vanity, superiority. These things come across very quickly in a narcissistic patient or a narcissistic person that you're dealing with. They, again, very little remorse and gratitude. If someone acts that way, one has to be a little bit careful. If they do something that everyone sees is wrong and, and they have no sense of, of, of guilt about it, something's wrong. If, if, something does, if someone does something nice for them and they just assume that they're entitled to it and don't make a conscious attempt to show appreciation and thanks, something's wrong with that. Um, Again, the kind of person that very rarely comes to therapy, but when they do, um, they can evoke a great deal of annoyance in the therapist because the therapist, like most of the people in the narcissist's life, are blotted out of existence. And so we have to be careful that we don't uh, show sort of counter-aggression to the narcissist. This, this evokes powerful reactions in therapists, and that has to be sat with and understood before the, the therapist can do good work with a narcissistic patient. Um, the best way to deal with a narcissist is to recognize the underlying dynamics. That instead of reacting aggressively to you being blotted out by their narcissism, you recognize the meaning of it, lean into it, and, and have a little compassion yourself for the sense of the suffering they must have undergone to have to be forced in, a, in, in effect to deal with such intense shame and such painful and damaging envy inside of them. They tend to run and hide, so you have to be gentle as a therapist. They won't generally be dangerous to anyone but themselves, frankly, but if you allow them, they will exploit you. This is one of the interesting things that, that McWilliams comes up with frequently is that she notices, and I think accurately, that there are certain types of personality characteristics that seem to gravitate toward other types. In this case, a narcissist will very frequently hook up with and get into relationships with a masochistic person, someone who sacrifices themselves. The narcissist is happy to hook up with someone willing to sacrifice to them. And I mean, this is a match made in hell. This is painful for everyone involved. It never is adaptive. It never is a source of much joy for anyone in the relationship. And we see this happening throughout McWilliams' uh, horizontal axes, and I will point out how one type of character uh, characteristic seems to attract another, uh, usually always with very bad consequences. So the best way to deal with narcissists is compassion and to recognize what's going on underneath, and I think that's actually a good way to, to handle most all of these. Let us turn now to chapter 9, Schizoid Personalities.